tonight, going home for the holidays thanks to an act of generosity. I never saw this day coming. A lost passport meant he was stuck here in Canada until... Oh my God, that's the guy on TV! A stranger's discovery and what she offered next. A six-year-old finds a cry for help inside a supermarket Christmas card. Canadians rush to help fight Australia's wildfire crisis. And reliving that Raptors glory. The reporters who were there reflect on one of the biggest stories of the year. The most epic celebration, champagne bottles everywhere. This is The National. Good evening, I'm David Common filling in tonight. We begin with a story of calamity and compassion made for the holidays. A student from Zimbabwe studying in Newfoundland was about to head home when he discovered he'd lost his passport and student visa. They were in a travel bag he'd returned to a store and that bag had already been resold when he went back. After days of searching, he was losing hope until the phone rang with good news and an extraordinary offer. Here's Talia Ricci. I'm so excited, you know, because I, I never saw this day coming. It's the day <laughs> Leonard Mawara will be reunited with his passport and student visa. After about two weeks of thinking they were gone for good. Are you April? Oh, yes! Oh, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> April Day is the woman who found it. She bought the bag for a Christmas gift after Mawara had returned it to Winners. When she went to wrap it... So I was like opening up the bag and I was like looking at it. And then I opened it up and I was like, oh my God, that's the guy on TV. This is the guy that's looking for his passport. And I was like shaking and crying. Day had seen Mawara's story in the news. I was lying in bed and I was looking at it and I was saying, Oh my God, that poor guy, like, is he going to be able to get home to his family? And I was like reading through some of the article, but I never read enough to see the picture of the bag. No, no. It's been a stressful time for the student at St. John's Memorial University. He said he couldn't eat or sleep. He tore apart his basement apartment looking for the passport. But I couldn't find it. So now I was, I was just home, hopeless, just thinking, you know, I'm just going to be in St. John's like the whole Christmas. Mawara uh, was supposed to go home to see his family for the holidays and to mourn the recent death of his younger brother. He was told he could get to Zimbabwe with emergency travel documents, but he needed his student visa to return to Canada. I never thought I would even receive these documents ever again. Maybe I would be getting a new passport. Now Mawara is free to travel, but he'd already cancelled his flight. Today, Day made him a generous offer. I'm going to uh, provide Leonard with a ticket so that he can return home to his family and enjoy his Christmas. A flight home from a stranger he now calls a friend. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. Okay. Give me a hug. Okay. I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Ali Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Well, now to the UK where a powerful message was found hidden in a brand new Christmas card. The British grocery chain Tesco, the world's third largest retailer, has pulled a line of Christmas cards from its vast sales network and broken ties with the Chinese supplier. It's all because a young girl who was about to write her own holiday wishes was surprised to find a joyless greeting wrapped in a desperate plea. Here's Anita Bath on what it means. A big surprise when six-year-old Florence Whittycomb sat down to write Christmas cards to her friends. We were writing in them and about on my sixth or eighth card, there was somebody already write it, written in it. When uh, my wife looked at the card, uh, it uh, of course said what it did, which is that, that uh, the card had come from somebody imprisoned uh, in uh, Shanghai. We are foreign prisoners in Shanghai Xingpu Prison, China, the card said, forced to work against our will. Please help us and notify human rights organization. The first thought was it must be some sort of prank. Uh, but uh, on reflection, we realized that it was actually potentially quite a serious thing. Uh, and so uh, I felt very shocked, but I also felt um, a, a responsibility. The message directed the family to contact human rights journalist Peter Humphrey, who was himself imprisoned there four years ago. 
And my final nine months of that captivity was in this very prison, in this very cell block where this message has come from. So this was written by some of my uh, cellmates from that period who are still there serving sentences. When Humphrey was a prisoner there, labor was voluntary, a way to earn money. What has happened in the last year or so is that work has become compulsory. In a statement, Tesco says the factory in question was audited last month and there was no evidence suggesting the use of prison labor. Tesco has now suspended the Chinese supplier and taken the cards off store shelves. Ready? Uh -huh. The Whittycomb family says such a desperate message is especially poignant at Christmas time. Anita Bath, CBC News, Vancouver. We're following a developing story out of British Columbia, the crash of a small plane on the west coast of Vancouver Island. A Cessna 172, similar to this one, left for the Courtney Air Park yesterday. It did not arrive. Wreckage was spotted this morning near Stewardson Inlet, an area so remote the RCMP hasn't been able to reach it yet. The BC coroner's office says it's been notified of one fatality. Some Canadian firefighters are giving up their holidays at home to come to the aid of emergency personnel in Australia. Just as Australia's Prime Minister is being called out for leaving the country while raging wildfires destroyed homes and claimed lives. Austin Grabish shows us just how bad things have gotten. It looks apocalyptic. Firefighters trying to stop the spread of an inferno. But despite all efforts, these fires are not slowing down. Here's just a few of the photos. Forcing residents like Elizabeth McLaren to flee with little notice. I hope my house doesn't burn down. But ultimately, a lot of my friends stayed to fight the fires at their house. They can't get out now, so I'm just hoping that they're safe. Like, I can replace my house, I can't replace lives. More than 100 fires are burning in New South Wales alone. Homes and property are being destroyed. A state of emergency in place amid a record-breaking heat wave. And making things even worse, extreme wind conditions. The fatigue management um, and the drain, the relentless nature of this season is certainly taking a toll and so too is the geographic spread of the activity. Australia has asked for a helping hand from other countries. The Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre has been activated in Winnipeg. This is the first time the centre has sprung into action during the winter. It's in charge of coordinating all firefighting assistance with Australia. So far, 51 fire specialists have already been sent abroad and another 18 are scheduled to be sent next Monday. I think th the most important thing to me is, is how proud I am of our men and women, our professional fire managers who are taking themselves away from their families and loved ones during this time of year to go on such an extended period of duty. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison drew criticism for going on a family vacation to Hawaii as the wildfires raged, claiming the lives of two volunteer firefighters. He's now back and accepting that criticism. If you had your time over again and you had the benefit of hindsight, then would have made different decisions. Um, I'm sure Australians um, are fair-minded and understand um, that when you make a promise to your kids, you try and keep it. Officials are hoping for cooler conditions to help put an end to this wave of destruction. Austin Grabish, CBC News, Winnipeg. In rural New Brunswick, a fire at a tire recycling plant is sparking concerns on a number of fronts. People are worried about uh, the jobs, of course, and then, of course, you have the environmental impact. Uh, people have some concerns about well water and, and air qualities. Clouds of ominous smoke have been pouring into the sky since yesterday morning. Water doesn't do much to douse the burning tires and could help toxins seep into the water table. We're considering smothering the fire with considerable quantities of sand. Uh, so we are bringing in uh, fairly sizable volumes. It'll take days to put this one out, says the fire marshal. And so far, the lack of wind has kept smoke from overwhelming neighborhoods, but residents have been told to limit their outdoor activity. The U.S. Congress is on Christmas break, and the frantic pace of cold, gray Washington, slower. And yet Jacqueline Hansen shows us the sudden new developments and supercharged rhetoric of Donald Trump's impeachment keep coming. In front of a crowd of pro-Trump students, Donald Trump isn't taking a break from the stage or his message. There was no crime. In fact, there's no impeachment. There's no, their own lawyer said there's no impeachment. What are we doing here? The world is watching. Watching and reading new documents. 
Hundreds of released emails shed light on interactions by White House officials before and after Trump's July call with the president of Ukraine. One email shows Trump started asking about military aid to Ukraine in June. Then a written request by a senior White House official to hold off on funds and to keep the request quiet due to its sensitive nature. Sent July 25th, less than two hours after that now infamous call. This email is explosive. The top Democrat in the Senate wants to know more. A top administration official, one that we requested, is saying, stop the aid 91 minutes after Trump called Zaleski and said, keep it hush hush. What more do you need to request a witness? It's still unclear if Trump's impeachment trial in the Republican-controlled Senate will have any witnesses. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi left for the holidays without sending the articles of impeachment to the Senate, saying she's waiting to learn more about what the trial will look like, a strategy defended today by Democrats. She's just trying to say, hey, let's not make this a circus, a partisan circus. No, I think But Republicans the ridiculed time. the holdup. The American people were tired of the sham and brushed off the latest emails. Yes, there was a delay. There's nothing new in these emails about the timing, truly, Chuck. There was a lot of emails and back and forth exchanges about timing of this. The aid was released. Whether or not the emails will be used as evidence in the impeachment process is unclear, but today's dispute is just the latest to divide the two parties that are already so far apart. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Washington. Still in the U.S., a section of interstate highway in Virginia became a tangled mess of twisted metal and shattered glass. It doesn't stop barking. Okay. That is a 69 vehicle pileup from earlier today, leaving more than 50 people injured, some of them critically. The cause is still under investigation, but officials note it was foggy and icy at the time of that crash. Protests over a new citizenship law in India have already turned violent and deadly. Now the outcry there is spreading here. People in both countries say the legislation discriminates against Muslims. And as Matt Damore reports, they're also alarmed by the Indian government's attempts to stifle dissent. From Surrey, B.C. to downtown Montreal. People came out today to show their solidarity with protesters in India. There has been a rising move of totalitarianism in India, and I think it's time that we stand up against it. They're angry about a new citizenship law in India that allows members of religious minorities who are in that country illegally to apply for citizenship. But the law does not apply to Muslims. The law has sparked intense protests in India as critics slam it as a violation of the country's secular constitution. Protesters and police have clashed and more than 20 people have died in the demonstrations. Montrealer Firoz Mehdi is a Muslim originally from India. He's worried about the climate in the country he used to call home. It's a very terrible situation and it has to be opposed. And what we can do here from Montreal best is to internationalize this issue to bring attention of the international bodies, the Canadian government. To try to contain the protests, parts of India have been hit by internet blackouts and large gatherings banned. Tactics also employed by the Indian government in an ongoing crackdown in Muslim-majority Kashmir. But protesters are demanding the right to speak out. This is fight for India. This is fight for democracy, basically. <laughs> At a rally today, Prime Minister Narendra Modi insisted the bill isn't anti-Muslim and accused his political opponents of spreading lies about it. What is happening in India today, it's very extremely dangerous. Still, protesters are worried about what could come next. So too the Canadian government. It's warning against non-essential travel to affected areas until the anger over the citizenship bill subsides. Madame Moore, CBC News, Montreal. A powerful and deadly storm kicked up huge waves as it barreled through Western Europe. Those waves along Spain's northwest coast were stirred up by winds up to 140 kilometers an hour, which also whipped up this thick sea foam coating the streets of Galicia. It's the second storm to hit the region in less than a week. At least nine people are dead and tens of thousands still without power. 
The Queen went to church today while Prince Philip remains in hospital. She arrived at a church near her Sandringham estate with Countess Sophie of Wessex. 98-year-old Prince Philip has been in hospital since last Friday. Buckingham Palace says he's being treated for a pre-existing condition. Also this weekend, the palace put out this photo of the Queen, son Prince Charles, grandson Prince William, and great-grandson Prince George making Christmas dessert. But for the first time in 230 years, there will be no Christmas Mass at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. The massive fire that ravaged the cathedral last spring brought down its famed spire and roof. So midnight mass will be held at a neighboring church with a platform being built to resemble the one at the famed cathedral. France's government has pledged to restore Notre Dame. The holidays can bring joy and excitement, but they can also be really tough for some, including those struggling with grief, like Leah Parsons. Her daughter, Retea, died by suicide six years ago after intense bullying and harassment. Now, as Kayla Hounsell explains, her mom is using that experience to help others. The idea is to create an open, welcoming space at a time when many feel so alone. There's something about Christmas that really kind of shines the light that she's not there. Leah Parsons lost her teenage daughter, Retea, after a suicide attempt in 2013. She lives with the tragedy every day, but the societal pressure to be happy during the holidays brings it all into focus. And it's just like this pressure cooker. You could blow. <laughs> so how can you kind of scale that back and say, maybe I go, but I'm only going for half an hour. Parsons has teamed up with a bereavement counselor to guide people through holiday grief. So that's super meaningful when people encounter someone who's, who's probably been through the worst thing you could ever imagine. I mean, she's just got street cred. They invite people to share. It hurts so much to just go rah, rah. And yep, yeah, this is fun and I'm being a good grandma and whatever, all the expectations of me. And that's Emotions so are real and raw. <laughs> I thought that it was over my guilt, but I still carry it. <laughs> and I don't know what makes me happy anymore. They say sometimes it helps to simply change traditions. I know the first year I definitely didn't take any of the boxes out, any of the Christmas boxes out, so I just did it completely different. We had a really funny moment the other day when, when you know, a woman who had lost a, a family member said, yeah, we just couldn't handle it and they were playing every Planet of the Apes movie. And so we watched Planet of the Apes all Christmas, every movie. And they said, that, and we call it now Christmas of the Apes. <laughs> because so many grievers say sometimes all they want is for people to say their loved one's name. Michelle. They end by doing just that. Mom, Dad, Retea. They encourage people to look for small joys over the holidays, but also to know it's okay if they can't. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, more news ahead tonight, including a really remarkable story that started decades ago on the other side of the world. If they could speak the stories that these candlesticks can, can, would, would say. Saved from the Nazi invasion, how these candlesticks wound up in a Toronto synagogue. Plus. I said, I'm not going to let go because my friend, I don't want him to drown. A quick-thinking 10-year-old boy saves his friend's life. All that ahead on The National. There is celebration across Canada tonight on this first night of Hanukkah. This was the scene north of Toronto in Thornhill where people also brought mittens, hats and socks to help keep those in need warm this holiday season. The Festival of Lights is extra special this year for one Toronto synagogue. It's celebrating an unexpected gift, a precious pair of candlesticks hidden from the Nazis. As Ellen Morrow tells us, the treasures have had an incredible journey. Wow. Years yes, to meet you. Right, right. A first meeting of yeah, two exactly. men with the connection spanning decades and continents. A story almost too fortuitous to believe even for them. Uh, when yeah. you first called me, right. I thought you were selling me a timeshare. Yes. <laughs> I was like, who is this guy? 
Instead, a gift of history, these silver candlesticks. Harold Irby's father was entrusted by his Jewish neighbors in Yaslo, Poland, to protect them from the Nazis. And can you imagine the hardship that person must have felt, said, here, you hold on to these. And my father said, listen, I believe you, you know, you have to trust me, I'll keep them safe. I don't know if he knew deep down, but I kind of feel he knew that someday mm -hmm. it would find its right home. The candlesticks were rescued from this synagogue in Yaslo, ravaged by Hitler's forces in 1939. Over the years, they were brought to Germany, then Italy, crossing the Atlantic to Halifax before arriving in Vancouver, where the Irby family eventually settled. If they could speak the stories that these candlesticks can, can, would, would say. In the spring, Irby decided to find a new home for them, back in the Jewish community. I googled uh, Yasso Synagogue and I said, this is destroyed. I searched further down and they built the replica of this Yaslo Synagogue in Toronto. I mean, I, I was speechless. And this is a replica of the Ark in Yaslo. Right. Rabbi Eli Carfunkel emulated the Yaslo Synagogue to honor the countless temples destroyed in the small towns of Europe. I mean, when you got the call from Harold, what did you think? So when he tells me that, that we have candlesticks, I, I couldn't believe it. And when they arrived? I started to cry. I mean. Yeah. Here is uh, the one synagogue from the thousands of synagogues that we could have chosen, and now we have candlesticks mm -hmm. from Yaslo. So and a lifelong come. bond. It is a great honor now to call up my newest BFF. Irby traveling across the country for a ceremony celebrating his family. Uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. My father thanks you, if you could. People watching the story, what do you want them to take away from this, this journey of these candlesticks. We should treasure these things, that we should respect each other and believe in each other. Uh, we need to focus on the goodness of people. If you continue the path of goodness, you will light up uh, uh, very dark places. And now, 80 years later, those candlesticks again giving light in a synagogue, a father's vow to keep them safe, honored by his family. Ellen Morrow, CBC News. Toronto. Next on The National, we will revisit one of our favorite stories of the year. From the locker room party to the parade that shut down a city, the Raptors championship win through the eyes of the reporters who covered it. I couldn't hear a word that Drake was saying, so I was just watching closely to see what he was going to do with that mic. That was amazing! Let's it go! The greatest comeback in franchise history! How great? Well, the Toronto Raptors came back from a 30-point deficit tonight, topping their previous record of 25. Another history-making moment for a team that had a big one earlier this year. It was arguably one of the biggest sports stories of 2019. When the Raptors grabbed the MD NBA championship in the summer, the city went wild. And much of the country did too. Devin Haru and Greg Ross take us back to that glorious win and the rip-roaring party that followed. In the hoopla of the championship. The Toronto Raptors, the only team outside of the United States to win the NBA championships. The most epic celebration, champagne bottles everywhere. It's chaos, it's pandemonium. These players are always so reserved, but not in this moment, and that's sort of a beautiful sight to see. And I should add, this is a very jacket that I wore that night. A little bit of champagne smell still from that celebration. In all of the hoopla of that moment was Kawhi Leonard sharing a quiet moment with his family, with his mom, and he had a champagne bottle. He's smiling, he doesn't show a lot of emotion, but this moment is important to him, and before he takes a swig of that champagne, he passes it over to mom first. 
she gets a first sweet taste of victory. That's a moment that stands out to me because it was such a personal moment for them. And it really told us a lot about Kauai and what family means to him. We of course have reporters throughout uh, the city today. Greg Ross is on the bus. This I was lucky enough to be on the buses with the players during that parade. <laughs> That's right, Dwight. We got Chris Boucher right here, and you were just. There were five buses in total uh, carrying the Raptors players and their families, and I had access to four of those buses. But there was one bus that they wouldn't let us on, and that was the bus that had Kawhi Leonard, it had Kyle Lowry, it had Fred Van Vliet, and it had Drake on the bus. I should see if I can get underneath Drake and throw him my microphone. <laughs> We were live on air, and I said, you know what, why don't I just throw the mic to Drake? And uh, I saw him, he was hanging over the side of the bus, and I was talking to uh, Adrian Arsenault and Dwight Drummond, and I said, I'll just go and I'll throw the mic to him. It's a tough like, call. You plan to do what with what? Because if, if you yes. go, right on. Hey. Yes, he did it. Coming to you live <laughs> for the big city. With the greatest in the world. I couldn't hear a word that Drake was saying, so I was just watching closely to see what he was going to do with that mic. That was amazing! And he does his mic drop, and I was able to catch the mic and just carry on with the live hit. And look at these fans just soaking it in as Drake kind of plays with everybody. We get these rare moments uh, in, our, in our reporting careers to cover such incredible moments. This poise this team has shown throughout this entire playoff run is something everyone continues to point to. And to see the way the country rallied around the team and to have a front row seat to all of it, champagne covered and all, was the best thing that could have ever happened. Well, from the moment the Toronto Raptors captured the NBA championship, the question has towered over this basketball season. Can they do it again? With no Kawhi and waves of injuries, well, as of tonight, they have the fourth best record in the NBA. Just before the season began, Adrian found out what drives Raptors president, Masai Ujiri, the man who knows better than most how far his team can go. They're one win away from their first ever NBA title. All of Canada knows how Masai Ujiri spent his spring. Hello, Lowry Siakam the maestro of a huge moment, the Toronto Raptors' historic NBA win. Canada, the NBA title is yours! A first for Canada, and were Canadians ever into it? <laughs> Ujiri had reason to smile. He deserves much of the credit for that win from pulling off that risky trade for Kawhi Leonard. Believe in the city, believe in yourselves. To building a roster that turned out to be greater than the sum of its parts. But there were complications. Allegations from the US that Ujiri pushed an Oakland officer the night the Raptors won it all. The panic, then the despair of fans who could not woo Kawhi to stay. Thank all of Toronto, the city, the country. Welcome. But as all that swirled, Masai Ujiri found time for his treasured program, The Giants of Africa. Basketball camps for young, hopeful players across the continent. Camps about so much more than basketball. This year, he took them to Cameroon, Mali, Morocco, South Sudan, and Somalia. He even took the NBA trophy back home to Nigeria with the hopes of inspiring a nation. How are you? Good morning. Okay? Morning, morning, morning. You doing okay? <laughs> yeah, I am. Good shirt. <laughs> yeah. We caught up with Masai Ujiri at one of the camps in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Fresh off the heels of this amazing win you had. I think there are a whole bunch of Canadians who might imagine. I bet Masai Ujiri this summer has got his feet up by a lake somewhere, kind of basking in the glory of this year. And yet, you know, we're sitting here in Tanzania. You've been crisscrossing this continent. Why? Uh, why? Because I, I think uh, the youth need, need this. Yeah, and what better time to come off a championship to send messages. Yeah, send messages to 
uh, the change that you want on the continent, the change that you want to instill in this youth uh, so, so that it registers in them. The only way for this continent to be great is you guys, okay? Always remember that. The majority of Africa is you. This is my happy hour, this is my golf, this is my um, whatever other people do. And yeah, this, is, this is what it is for me. And you get to hear that sound. And you get to hear that sound. Those kids are laughing, those balls are going. It's an incredible like, time. Where does the funding come from? Um, I have basically like negotiated my salary where part of it goes is for Giants of Africa. If, I, if I'm making $20, I say $3. I negotiate higher just to get um, the money for this. And it's one of the biggest things that I really appreciate because it built this, it started this. What's your best moment from this tour so far? If I'm to pick one moment on this trip so far, I would say going back to Zaria with the trophy mm. and giving my parents the trophy was incredible for me. For my dad to look at me and tell me that I make, I, I make, him, I make him feel big, <laughs> those things were, were so powerful. That's me personally. Hey, Toronto everywhere. Yeah. He grew up in Nigeria. That connection to Africa courses through him. Okay, we have to get this jersey off. Never a player in the NBA, but a scout initially. He still looks for and finds talent. He brought the likes of African-born Pascal Siakam, Serge Ibaka, and coaching staff to the Raptors. To see them be a part of that championship win was extraordinary. Can you take me to that moment when it worked, when you won. I'm wondering what the 12-year-old Maasai in you was, was doing in that moment. My first instinct when we won was to go find my wife. And I thought about my kids. They were not at the away game. They were in Toronto. Uh, and the second thing that came to me was Africa won, you know, uh, Canada won. You know, like we prove to people that you ain't have to, you don't have to come from a certain place uh, to win. And when they won that night, something odd happened. Go, 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 go. The Oakland Sheriff's Office says Masai Ujiri shoved a deputy twice as he tried to get past him to the court to celebrate. There may yet be charges. What happened on that court? Uh, you know, I, I it's still going on and um, I, I know who I am as a person and I respect authority and respect uh, obviously the police and I, I, won't, I won't comment on anything, you know, like before. Um, what does that mean, you know who you are? I, I'm only trying to celebrate like winning a championship. That's all I was trying to do and I know the person that I am. You had your credentials, you showed them? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave that till it's, <laughs> till it's all said and done. Is that but, your decision or is the NBA said not to talk? No, it's my decision. One of, the, one of the discussions that's been happening around you, not, not with you, because you're, you're not talking publicly about it, is that was there an element of racism to what happened there, a big element? Have you felt racism in, in your job? Uh, to be honest, no. Yeah, I, I stay focused, you know, and uh, to be honest, my focus is winning, you know, and if somebody comes and is a certain way to me, you know, like I, that's not what comes to my mind mm -hmm. at all, you know, so I don't even give it a chance, and I think that helps me. I have to ask you too about the Toronto heartbreak. How did Toronto lose Kawhi? How did you lose Kawhi? Uh, if he wants to go home, um, He's gone home. You know, I couldn't tell Toronto if there was a team in Lagos, Nigeria, or in Zaria, Nigeria, there was an NBA team there. I don't know if I would stay in Toronto. You know, like that's, there are some callings in life, you know, like and some things that pull people one way or the other. And I completely like under, understand that. 
But it, it must have been more complicated than Kawhi saying, I want to go home, and you saying, oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, you try, you're going to try and convince the player. You're trying, you trying to keep the player. Um, there's a lot, part, plenty part of him that wanted to stay. And, what, what part of him wanted to stay? Oh, winning the city, you know, like everything um, he won in the city. He had one of the greatest shots in, in NBA history now. By Simmons, is this the dagger? The fans, an unbelievable parade. Look at it, it's crazy. Yeah, those things, I know Kawhi, I know they, you know, they, he, he really thought about all those things, but at the end of the day, he made a decision and his decision was to go back How did you home. find out about it? Where, where were you? How did you hear? I think I was in Rwanda. I was in Rwanda and I, I spoke to them on the phone. I spoke to him and I spoke to his uncle. How did you break it to Drake? <laughs> no, I think I th the Kawhi has a has a relationship with Drake, so I'm, I'm sure he told, he told him himself. Yeah, I'm sure he told him himself. Who was the hardest conversation, sort of letting people know about Kawhi? Who was the hardest person to tell? Honestly, it's not that difficult for me. You know, some people call me a stone heart, or you know, like that's the business that we've put ourselves to do. Uh, if you didn't I didn't cry a little bit. Oh uh, no. No, no, no way, not even close. I, I, there's no way I can cry because of because a player left. You go find the next player. <laughs> yeah, I'll cry here. When you look at those kids in their eyes, you know, like I see myself and I see the opportunity that God has given me, the NBA has given me. And um, in your dreams, you know, they are wild dreams, but in your dreams, you wish that every, all of them can have that opportunity, at least have the opportunity to try. He wants the kids to dream of getting good enough at basketball to secure scholarships and good educations and good jobs. But once a scout, always a scout. And just maybe the next star is waiting for the Raptors only, of course. At the end of the day, we play sports to win. We can hold hands all we want and do Giants of Africa all we want. Sports is done to win, yeah, and I want to win. And whoever I'm bringing uh, to the Toronto Raptors, it's, it's to win. So the, the presidents of the other teams must look at you and think, hmm, this guy, this guy has a magic formula. Are they a little bit jealous of you? Are they? No, no, no. There's never any that kind of talk. You know? Nobody gives you the gears about coming over here. And sometimes, you know, like sometimes it's seen as a, as an advantage. You know? Sometimes it's like, oh, okay, he's he has access to all of this stuff. But I think they you know. You have a pipeline. Yeah, there's a there's with Giants of Africa. Obviously, I've seen many kids, but I think they know why I do it. Your future. I mean, so many people were convinced that, that your friend Barack Obama would really work hard to try to get you to go to the Washington Wizards. Mm -hmm. How hard did he try? Uh, we talked about it. What's going on, people? But no, our friendship is not that way. Um, he's been an incredible mentor to me. And his friendship is not to convince me. <laughs> yeah, his friendship is to give me all the best information to be the best leader where I am. And it's incredible the advice and the kind of advice he gives. He's, he's a remarkable person and I, I really appreciate that. But no, um, I talk to him far more beyond, you know, like those things. Barack Obama! It was great to see him at the Raptors game. Was that a big deal for you? A huge deal. Yeah, it's a huge deal. I say this uh, to have him there. Um, I'll be proud of that. You know, for the rest of my life, it's something that I'll never ever forget. And you, people really did wonder if if you'd done everything you wanted to accomplish in Toronto. If if you were tempted to move on, were you? Uh, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't. Um, if there came a time. You know, I think people would understand, you know, like why. But um, I know uh, this is where my kids were born, you know. This has become part of me, you know. Canada has become part of me, and I love that. Championship number two? 
hey, we're going to get it. And <laughs> I don't know when it will be, but we're going to get it. Just like I said, we'll get the first one. And I said, I didn't know when we'll, I will get it, but we will. I guarantee you we will. You know, like I, I, I have the ultimate confidence that um, at the time, the time will come. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Masa. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. You heard Adrian there asking about the shoving incident. Well, since that piece first aired, that situation has been resolved. After meeting with Ujiri, prosecutors announced in October they would not proceed with charges, saying the matter was better handled outside the courtroom. Ujiri says he was pleased the matter was behind him. Time for a quick break. Up next, we catch a flight with commuters in California for a new solution to rush hour traffic. We're back after this. If you live or work in a city, you've probably felt the pain of rush hour co commutes. So imagine if you could just skip the traffic and soar above it to work instead. As Kim Brunhuber shows us, it's an idea catching on south of the border. I'm on one of the busiest commutes in the U.S., Oakland to San Francisco. But after a couple of clicks on a new app, soon I'll be floating happily over the winking brake lights. The aim is really to bring the air to the masses. If you live in the Bay Area, Mexico City, or Sao Paulo, a new ride-on-demand urban helicopter service allows you to take a chopper to work like a CEO or a head of state for a fraction of the cost. We offer flights that are ranging between 150 US dollars to 275. So it's not yet a mass market product, but that's definitely more affordable than the 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, helicopter flight. The drive across the Bay Bridge below me would typically take at least an hour. It takes me less than 15 minutes. With congestion increasing every year, there are now more customers willing to pay a premium and more startups taking off. Surf Air's flight membership service offers the option of unlimited flights for a fixed price, which means Tracy Kime can afford to work in Silicon Valley and live in LA. We're starting to turn into a convenience culture, so this type of air travel. Again, like Amazon Prime, it's just all about convenience. These startups claim they'll help reduce congestion, but this transportation expert says it's probably not going to make the drive to work any faster for those stuck on the ground. In the U.S., a single traffic lane on a freeway carries up to 2,000 vehicles per hour um, when it operates at capacity. I mean, there's no way you can match that uh, in the space above city. So this is absolutely not going to be a congestion relief mechanism. Self-flying vehicles and personal helicopters may be the future of commuting. But for most of us, flying to work is just a dream. Still, the trend points up. Eventually, more commuters will look out of their windows and see this instead of this. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, San Francisco. Coming up on The National, our moment. It has the makings of a Christmas miracle. Hear from two friends, one boy who fell into an icy harbor and the other who wouldn't let his friend go. That's coming up next. These two friends are holding each other extra tightly after a terrifying experience this week. One of them fell into freezing icy waters and the other refused to let go. The ending of this story could have been very different, but instead of tragedy, there's relief. And tonight, it's our moment. I thought like he was drowning, so I ran as fast as I can. He's way heavier than me, so I try to pick him up, but I can't. So I keep holding him. I start punching the ice. I'm still grabbing him with the one hand. I'm bringing him to the shallow end because I can't pick him up. And then we see a police car driving by because they do a search every 50 minutes. I was really scared and t until Alex started holding me. I felt a little bit better but because the coldness was still like really, really cold. I started getting like I started getting scared until like the police came. It was really hard to carry him for that long, but like I said, I'm not gonna let go because he's my friend. I don't want him to drown. I'm never gonna go down there because now I only I always have the image that I'm falling in again. He was my best friend. Now, now he feels like a really good brother to me. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, boy, this is a story that really could have turned out almost any other way. 
But it's very lucky that little boy, Lucas, was almost completely submerged. Amazing that the police came along just when they did. So lucky. And that is The National for December 22nd. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'm David Common. Have a great night.